Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. This is Ildiko Oravets. She is located in New Mexico right now, living under a name that translates to fierce warrior in Hungarian can send many messages to a young girl transitioning from a host of divergent cultures throughout her life. For Ildi, it meant that success happens best when it's not built alone. Through a fierce and colorful past that began in South Africa, followed by part of her life in Hungary and then New Mexico, her greatest philosophies were to listen to your gut build a culture you believe in, and maintain a posture that promotes further enrichment. She now translates those life lessons into her Tribal Abundance program, where the concept of collaboration and connection is taught as a framework for ensuring success through interpersonal networks. She designed the program basing the concepts on the research of Colin Turnbull, who studied two different, very different tribes and how their approaches to abundance and scarcity resulted in two very different mindsets, usage of resources, and consequences. Ildi's book, Tribal Abundance, was published recently in 2019. Ildi is an associate, um, excuse me, as an associate certified coach as well as a certified performance technologist. When not coaching or consulting, she balances her life by digging in her garden and enjoying life in her backyard patio, walk, going for walks with her husband and tending to the two rescue dogs that watch her every move and wayward cat that lives on her front porch. Thank you so much for your time today, Ildi. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I am doing really well. Thank you. Yay! Well, I appreciate your time and coming on talking about fear and struggles in your life and your experience with all of that. So let's dig in and tell us something interesting about your life. Something interesting. Well, you heard a little bit of it in, in my bio that you read. I'm originally from South Africa. I'm not originally from the United States, although many people say I would never know that based on your lack of accent. And I always tell people I worked really, really hard. We moved from Johannesburg, South Africa to small town, New Mexico. And I just worked really, really hard to get rid of my accent because at the age of 10, you just want to fit in. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So you came the age of 10. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I would have never guessed that either, but that's super fun to know. Um, so, so talking about fear, let's go back. And when was a significant time in your life that fear had held you back from living your life fully? I actually think that probably the first time that I can remember feeling that kind of a fear was when we moved here. So it was a huge shift. And even though both countries speak English, it's very different. It was almost like learning a new language. And um, I actually share a little bit about that in my book because it felt, you know, in reflecting back, I realized I actually was learning a new language, a new culture. There was so much going on. And I think I, I kind of froze a little bit. I had a lot of fear. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to make friends. I wanted to, you know, you're, you're a kid. You just want to have fun and play. And I found myself really um, being held back by the fear. And I found that I was kind of overcome with, with different insecurities. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good point. You know, we all want to be liked and that's like the biggest fear that a lot of people have is um, the need to fit in and not feel like an outcast. And especially when you're the new kid on the block, um, you end up feeling those, those feelings and those insecurities along the way, but coming from a different country as well. I mean, I can only imagine uh, and coming to America. I mean, I don't know. I feel like it would probably be very different. And, and like you said, same languages, but very different cultures and um, how, how the, everything would go. So, yeah. Um, so you said you were 10. And um, so when you were going through those fears and struggles and 
being put into the new cultures and everything, you know, what really compelled you to just step into not caring as much? And um, were you able to like relax and be yourself more? Tell us more about like that turning point for you. Yes. And, and I love that you asked that question because for me, it was actually a process. So starting at the age of 10 with that big move, with that big transition, there were a lot of things that I sort of called into question in my life, you know, like everything that had been true for me now shifted and normal behavior for me was now, you know, like now the behavior that was considered normal in another culture was something that was foreign to me. And so it wasn't something that happened overnight. It really was a process. And I'll be honest, I think it probably took me at least into my 20s to get to that point where I could finally feel comfortable enough in myself to really just be who I am. I love that you said, you know, that we, we kind of all want to fit in. We all kind of want to be liked. That was very much a driving force for me. And what happened, and I think this happens to a lot of people, is then you become the people pleaser. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my coping mechanism for a lot of my life. I did eventually, you know, through lots of different things did come to that point where I was like, I, that's not working for me anymore. (laughs) It helped me to get through, you know, my, my, um, my elementary school, high school, um, college. And then as I moved down into the world and then I recognize it, that, that just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You could only, um, hide the real LD for, for so long, right? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And it's not that I was hiding the real Ildi. It's, it's just that what other people thought about me meant so much more to me than, than what I thought about myself. So mm. it's almost, and, and probably, you know, many of you can relate to this. It's how I, I judged myself, how I identified how well I was doing was not my own perception. It was based on what other people were saying. Oh, Ildi, that's great. You did great. Oh, that means I did well, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily recognize that myself. So it's, it was yeah. very much having that reflected back to me. That's a great point. Thank you for, for clarifying that. That's, that is very true. And, and what we think about ourselves is the most important thing. So um, the, the difference is, is huge um, in, in switching the mindset about that too. And like you said, you know, it took you, what, you said the middle, like 20s? Yes. Yeah, so that was a good, you know, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. But you figured it out and that's great. So, um, so when, when you were, you know, transitioning and figuring out who you wanted to be and say, and know who you were, um, how did relationships or friendships, um, change through that time with you two? I think that it, It actually probably happened a little bit later when it, when I felt as though those were really changing. I mean, I'm still friends with many of the people that I went to high school with, you know, we're, we're friends. We've seen each other go through all of those transitions and seen one another really come into ourselves and to be very comfortable in our own skin. I also feel as though part of that is just the whole aging process. It's a journey and you do hit these certain uh, milestone birthdays where you you realize that it really doesn't matter what other people think about you. You, you stop caring. <laughs> However, yeah. I will say, so like there are two elements to, to the relationships. I mean, as you know, my book, Tribal Abundance, my program, Tribal Abundance, I'm all about tribes. So having relationships around me where people are very supportive and collaborative and accepting, I, I think that has been key, especially when And, you know, you've had, we've all probably had those relationships where we're, we have a significant other, we have a partner where they may not necessarily have been the best person for us and they cause us to question ourselves. So it's like having both extremes, having, you know, been in a relationship where it was not necessarily the best relationship for me at the time, I learned a ton from it and it made me go, okay, that, I want the opposite of that for my life. And then building a tribe around me of people that love and support me, no matter, they, they're just very accepting and open of me. 
when I'm, when I'm just being a human being, when I'm imperfect. So. Yeah. And that's a great point too, the imperfect part and, and being open to like, um, the connections and collaborations and really the accepting, like you said, acceptance and support that we find in our relationships, they'll make and break what you're moving towards in, in, in life in general in relationship building, um, in those friendships too. So that's a, that's a really great point too. the collaboration and, and the accepting of who you are and them accepting you and moving forward in, in that space. Absolutely. And I can't remember the quote exactly, but there is the quote that talks about like, look at the five people around you, you know, the five people closest to you and that's who you are. And there actually came a point in my life when I really did an evaluation in a sense of the relationships that I had, friendships, any kind of relationship. And I could kind of recognize some where I'm like, oh, this is this is an emotional vampire. (laughs) You know, this is a soul sucker and, you know, love and blessings to them. And I don't have room in my life for that. Um, Life is too short. Life is too precious and they are on their own journey and that's wonderful for them. And they're not part of my inner circle. They're not necessarily part of my tribe. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great, um, a great thing to know. Like, it's okay to let those relationships go. And um, it, yeah, they, if they don't serve you anymore, there's no reason for them to hold space in your life. Yes, yes. So, um, so really, was there, what was the turning point for you? Like what, what helped you jump ship from having the fear of what other people were talking or thinking or what you were thinking that other people were thinking about you basically? Um, what was the, what was the, turning point for you? Um, was it leaving school and, and being open to more um, relationships outside of where you were for school? Or what, what helped you jump ship from having those fears? You know, I, I love that you asked that question, because when I reflect back on that, it's hard for me to say specifically, here was the turning point. I really feel it though, it was a process and a journey sure. the whole time. One thing that I did notice is once I turned 30, and it wasn't like this magical thing that happened on that day, but when I shifted from 20 to 30, first of all, I thought, oh my gosh, my life is ending. My 20s are gone. I'm, I'm now, you know, I, I really thought that. And, you know, I went out and got my nose pierced and I got a tattoo. I'm like, goodbye to my youth. Life is ending. Yeah. And what people don't tell you is when you turn 30, that's when you first start thinking, you know, I, I like who I am. I'm comfortable in my skin and I don't judge myself or gauge myself by others' perceptions of me. I think that really was the start of it. And it seems as though each decade I've, you know, I've learned and grown. And that was probably the last birthday where I was like, ah, I'm getting older. Cause now I find that I really embrace each decade. Yeah. But, um, but I think the big, the big piece really is about um, accepting yourself. And if that's someone, you know, if you think that, you know, I'm not fabulous, or I mean, if, if you ever have any thoughts about yourself where you're down on yourself, a lot of people have the bad habit of, um, you know, it might be self-deprecating humor, yeah. or they might say, you know, you do something, you go, oh, I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. We yeah. can sometimes speak in ways towards ourselves that we would never speak, you know, towards our closest friends right? And, or our dearest, you know, our partners, our, our families. And so I think that's a huge practice to really take hold of and yeah. never say anything to yourself that you, you know, you wouldn't say to someone you love. And we, you know, treat yourself with love and honor and respect. It really is about yeah. treating yourself as the amazing creation you are. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually something my, my mother always said to me was treat others the way you want to be treated. <laughs> and, and she would just always say that. And that, that's just a huge thing that I've always held too, is that, you know, if I'm not going to speak badly to my friends and I don't want to speak badly to myself either. And, um, it goes back to, like you said, too, the, the five people that we hold it in our lives that we surround ourselves with. They're pretty much a sum of who we become or who we are. And um, I think that's 
it's a huge part of who our tribe is and needing to know those standards and, and also a reflection of yourself holding that mirror. Yes, definitely. And, you know, and so it kind of goes hand in hand. So I, I now, I mean, it's very rare when I would say something negative about myself when I go, oh, I can't believe I did that. That was so dumb. Very rare. And the second those words come out of my mouth, I'll immediately switch those. And I'm like, oh. wait a second. That's not true. You know, that is not true. We all have kind of these, these limiting beliefs, these voices that kind of come up in our, in our minds, in our heads. Sometimes we don't even know what the root of them is. And it's really important just to kind of take those captive and immediately switch. And then even when you interact with your friends, you know, being aware, very aware, of those five people, like how you're interacting with one another, how you're supporting one another. Do you have someone in your life that you're, you know, when you share something with them and you say, oh, I'm so excited. I've got this great idea, this new business I'm going to start or this new project, or I'm going to write a book or whatever it is. If you have someone that says, oh gosh, you know, um, you really need to be careful um, or, or be, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. You know, it's, again, it's that same thing. It's like, you want the people that say, that is awesome. That is amazing. How can I support you? So yeah. it's being very in tune with that, like having that very supportive tribe around you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes to um, like energy, right? Like if people are putting out the negative and scared energy for you, it's probably um, their perception of things in their own life that they're, they're putting their fear and, and those feelings towards what you're excited about. And like you said, those are the people that you want to keep at arm's length. They're not the people you want in your tribe of five around you specifically, because um, you want the people that want to celebrate you winning and, um, and celebrate you even doing the scary things because we have to do scary things, right? The point isn't that we have no fear. The point is that we have daily fears that we're still stepping out in them and overcoming them along the way. We're going to always have fear. And if we let the little ones scare us now, the big ones are just super scary and they'll paralyze us. And then we'll, then, then what? Uh, absolutely. I mean, having a fear-based approach is really going to limit you. It's going to handicap you because then you're not going to want to just leap into things. And I love what you said because it, it's true. We don't learn, we don't grow unless we take risks. And yeah, we're going to fall flat on our faces sometimes. We're going to fail. And yeah. how wonderful that we get that yeah. opportunity and that we get to try. And, you know, and then you might you recognize, okay, that didn't work so well. Here's how I can tweak that. Here's how I can refine it. Or it might be, you know what, that really wasn't for me. How wonderful that I tried it out. And now yeah. I know for sure that that's not my path. But it is, it's, um, you know, not having that, um, that fear, not taking the risks, not taking the chances. So I think people yeah. are always well-meaning, right? They're, they're very right. well-meaning. They're like, oh, you know, be careful or, or, you know, they don't want us to get hurt. But yeah. I love what you said. It's, it really is they're, they're kind of projecting their own insecurities and their own fears on us. So. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's all very true. And, and I don't know. Yeah, that's, I'll just leave it with that. I think that's a great, <laughs> um, but so what advice would you give uh, um, around overcoming fear? I, so uh, first of all, again, I think it's about a journey. You, you're not going to snap your fingers and all of right. a sudden all fear is gone. I think one of the key elements, so I, you know, tribal abundance, I talk about developing an abundance-based mentality versus a fear-based. So trusting and believing that there are good things out there for you and that things are going to work out for you. And one of the, the, you know, the, the first things you need to do is really focus on self-love. I can remember being uh, raised to be taught that, you know, self-love is, is selfish and that, of course, you love yourself. You don't have to focus on loving yourself. Um, you know, look how selfish we are. And I, that kind of held me back a little bit. When I came to the place where I realized, and it's that same old you know, analogy that most people use of when you're on a plane and the oxygen mask comes down, you need to put that oxygen mask on yourself 
before you can help anyone around you. And it made me realize that we, we often think of the term selfish as, as a negative. I think it's, it's, it's more about self-care and being taking care of ourselves. And then we are able to give and to be the compassionate, empathic, amazing people that we are. So I think the, really, the first step is really liking yourself. And, and not just liking yourself, really loving yourself. There are tons of things you can do to grow in that area. And, and I think that's definitely the first step. Yeah, absolutely. I always, I always um, tell people, you know, it's not selfish, it's selfless. Like it, if you're not taking care of ourselves, then how can we pour into other people? And um, our world does definitely go without if we're not at our loving ourselves and um, stepping out into our own greatness and those kinds of things, then we are, we are stagnant with our life and, and we're not moving forward and, um, we need those supportive people and we need to have the, the braveness inside of us to just say like, do it. And it like, um, I was going to say before, now I remember that everything is a learning experience, whether we succeed or we fail, or, you know, it just doesn't turn out the way we thought that happens all the time, right? And it's all a learning experience. You, you learn what you need to change, you learn what worked and what didn't, and, and you kind of just pivot with it and move forward with it. And um, really reflection of yourself, I think, like you were saying, self-care has to be number one, because you are the most important person in your life. So. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I love how you kind of reframe that or you characterize that around the fact that you know, uh, uh, failure is not really failure. It, it right. is just a step in the journey. And as a reformed people pleaser, it was, it took me a long time to learn to, to focus on self care. The thing is when you are constantly giving and you're constantly focusing on other people first, you basically empty yourself out. There's no oxygen left, right? And you've completely exhausted yourself. And then you find yourself snapping at someone or, you know, getting mad at someone and you're not in your best self, you know, yeah. that kind of the shadow side comes through. And so it's definitely about you, you are the best for other people when you're completely supported when you've done all those things for self-care, sometimes it is just that five minutes you need to sit and take some deep breaths and, and just relax a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a huge practice in, yes. in order to be able to be the best version of yourself. Yes. And I agree that it needs to be, it needs to be a daily practice. Absolutely. So not just once a month going to get a massage or something <laughs> grand, you know, it doesn't have to be grandiose. It just has to be effective. And, and maybe that is only five minutes of, you know, reflection about you and whatever you need to do or reading a book or any little things. But if it's for you, then it's, it's probably good. Absolutely. And I think most, most women that I talk to uh, have some kind of a, a daily morning ritual. And yes. it, it might involve, you know, a few minutes of meditation or prayer, maybe some exercise, um, journaling, reading. Uh, I know for me, part of my morning ritual is my morning latte that I, you know, I just. Favor that as I'm reading, like I just enjoy it, start off the, in a way that sets you up for success. And maybe you don't have the time, you know, maybe you're dashing off to work, wake up five minutes earlier and have that five minute of deep breathing or prayer or meditation. It'll transform. It'll transform your your whole. And there's, I have heard about, you know a thought or like scent or something repeated daily. Like we have the same thoughts. So making the routines and making them a habit for us, the things that are really important, we do those. Like. We get in our car, we go to work. Half the time, we're not thinking about those things. We're just doing them on autopilot. And um, figuring out what your routine is can be a really huge thing for, like you, you said, setting yourself up for success. 
us to have a, a great day and so in what you have in the routine in place that your self-care is one of the first things you take care of in, in, in your day to get it going in the right direction. Absolutely. And you know, our brains have to make so many decisions throughout the day that yeah. it actually is very comforting to the brain to know that when I wake up, this is my little routine, you know, yeah. my five minutes of mirror work and positive affirmations or my 10 minutes of journaling and drinking my coffee and, and my affirmations or meditation or, or whatever it is. Like it really comforts the brain to have that routine because that's one less decision your brain has to make. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I totally agree with that. I love it. So, okay. So you are getting really good at, you know, moving through the fears and making sure that you are taking the steps to go through it. So now that you're living fearlessly, I would love to dream with you and tell us where you see yourself five years from today. Oh, I love that question. So I have big dreams, big hopes. I, my goal, my vision is that tribal abundance becomes a movement. So I originally started this program because I looked at the work world and how, how tough it can be for folks. There are people that are they, they wake up and they dread going into work. They're miserable. Uh, they feel as though they're not supported. They feel as though the people they work with are, you know, they could be bullying them or there could be conflict that never gets resolved. And, and nobody wants that, you know? You, no. We spend so much time, for those of us who, who work for a full, in a full-time job, you spend a good portion of your time there. I would say for, for entrepreneurs, it's a lot more, <laughs> No, at times it can be you put a lot more into it, but we have the freedom, we have the luxury of not necessarily having to go into an office building and, and yeah. working there. So I see a movement where people are becoming more of a tribe, they're interacting more of a tribe and with an abundance mindset, and they're not worried about what information am, can I share, you know, or if I share this, is somebody going to steal my ideas or, you know, that people work together in a supportive and collaborative way and yeah. therefore they become a much yeah. more high performing team. And, and I think just organizations will be much more productive. We oh. cannot, we can't keep this hierarchical, you know, type of approach to how people work together because it's, it's just, it's not natural. That's not how we, um, you know, how we are at our very core. Yeah. I think collaboration is key and, and having the abundance mindset yeah. um, in everything is like you said, just, it's better for everyone instead of the scarcity and um and that mindset which doesn't serve anyone it just keeps people in in the fear space like we were talking about so yes yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely so i would love for you to share where everyone can connect with you personally thank you yes um so you can connect with me i've got a couple of websites i have my tribal abundance website it's just tribalabundance.com and also my highperformanceconsulting.com website. And I love hearing from people. I love people reaching out to me. Um, you can find the book Tribal Abundance on Amazon. And I would be so honored if you would uh, consider purchasing that book. And if you do read it, I would love to have a review. Um, so yeah, that's how you can get in touch with me. Plus I'm on Facebook, so... <laughs> There Perfect. aren't that many Ildico Oravetsas on Facebook. Believe it or not, I'm not the only one. There are others. Really? But... <laughs> that, is, that is surprising, but I mean, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. um, so, okay, so what's one last thing you would love to leave with the viewers? Honestly, it is focus on finding one thing that you love about yourself. So if you're in a place where you are, are struggling with this and you don't feel that you can just dismiss what people think about you because you feel as though your identity, your self-image, your self-worth has to do with what other people think of you, then I would say find that one thing about yourself. And don't focus on appearance because appearance is unimportant. It really is. I Trust me, I probably, you know, on this, that it's so unimportant. What is that one characteristic? You're kind, you're giving, you're compassionate. I mean, there are so many positive things about you. You're strong, you're direct, whatever it is. Find that one thing and focus on that and really 
focus on loving yourself for that, for the amazing person that you are. I love the, uh, the one that just stuck out to me is you are direct. I was like, Ooh, that is a great affirmation. I am direct because that was one of the things that I always thought for fear with, with, with me was I'm too bold or I'm too like forward or whatever. No, I am direct. I've never thought about that. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. I love that we are kind of getting away from these very antiquated ideas of what a woman is, who a woman is. We don't have to be sweet and nice and kind. There's nothing wrong with that. I embrace that. You know, many of my dear friends are sweet and nice and kind. And we're bold, we're brash, we're creative, we're courageous. So I, lo yes. I love that. <laughs> and we are fearless. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I love it so much. Thank you so much for your time, Ildi. It was so fantastic to get to hear more about your story. And everyone that's listening, go get Tribal Abundance. Ildi is amazing. And um, leave her a review when you do. Um, and Ildi, thank you again for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. <laughs> Good. You're so welcome. Thank you. And everyone remember to love yourself and live fearlessly. Thank you. Absolutely.